Association, but uh, for now, uh, APL UW Seattle. Uh, and what I'm going to talk to you about today is the recently completed field campaign for the Arctic Sea State and Boundary Layer Physics Program. This is an Office of Naval Research program. The large program, you can see by the title slide here, there are many, many people involved uh, from institutions really around the world. Um, all of them in some way, shape, or form directly supported by ONR, some also with internal NRL funding, and some with some European funding, some other programs that have um, that have come in to join us uh, because we have a unique uh, observational program and, and they wanted to get involved. And then ONR Global also was involved to bring in some other international collaborators. Uh, so we are now, uh, we've just collected data. We are in the fourth year of a five-year program. So what we're doing now is data analysis and synthesis and starting to write papers and, and whatnot. And what I'm going to focus on is the science we're doing and, and really focus on this, the, the recent field campaign and try to walk you through that and, in a narrative sense, give you uh, an idea of some of the science that we saw and that we think is going to come out of this as we get further and deeper into the data set. So the opening slide here has a sort of a cute logo that we put together that tried to describe everything we were doing. Uh, and you'll see that very prominent in that is the Sekuliak. This is the new polar class research vessel that is uh, operated by University of Alaska Fairbanks and is was supported by NSF and is owned by by NSF. It's a UNOL ship, so it's part of the U.S. research fleet. And we were one of the first full fully fledged science cruises to use this vessel, and I think we used it very effectively and really used it um, almost in, in really in an ideal way given its set of design uh, conditions and and uh, design obje objectives. Uh, and you'll see some buoys, some airplanes, and satellites and things, and those will all come into play. But what I want you to come away from mostly from this title slide is actually the background. The background of the title slide is a field of pancake ice. And that pancake ice is something that uh, I think we really hadn't talked about or thought about much in the Arctic. Uh, and that pancake ice is, is something that was a big part of our cruise, and I think we saw a lot of. So uh, keep that in mind as we go through. Pancake ice is an ice formation type, a process really that, that manifests in this, these patterns uh, that involves waves. And waves are a big part of this story. And it's something that is a ubiquitous ice type in the Southern Ocean around Antarctica, but it's not something we're really familiar with thinking about in the Arctic or at least in the Western Arctic. So uh, that we'll come back to. Now, moving on to the second slide, this is a process schematic, and it's trying to show you in a, a graphical way all the different things that we were interested in, all the different science processes we're interested in. And this schematic actually comes from an earlier ONR program, the Marginal Ice Zone Program, which was the 2014 field campaign. And you've probably heard about this some um, in various presentations and some of the papers that are starting to come out. But the process schematic really we found useful to also inform our project and to be able to describe our project. And uh, there are two things that I'll call out that are distinct to our sea state program. One is a real focus on the surface, on the surface fluxes, what's happening right at the surface. And by that, I mean the interface between the air, the ice, and the ocean, and all the different exchanges that are happening there. And that's really what drives the evolution of the sea ice, of course, is the heat and momentum fluxes that happen there and causes things to either melt or freeze or move around or or to become compacted and develop pressure and, and change. Uh, and so you can see some of those things here on the right-hand side of the image. There are some waves coming in from open water, and they, they may be breaking up the ice and changing the character of the ice, changing the flow size distribution of the ice. At the same time, the ice is changing the waves. It's attenuating the waves, and you see from right to left, the wave signal is, is lost in that process. And then you see lots of things happening uh, in the ocean at depth. There's, there's stored heat down there, which may, uh, in a mixing event, may come to the surface and, and be part of the surface fluxes. And then, of course, on the atmospheric side, there are very strong fluxes when the sun is out and when the wind is blowing and, and lots of things happening there. So we're interested in all of these processes, uh, but of course we have to be a bit more specific in order to make progress. And so we uh, decided to focus on the fall freeze-up, which is really distinct from the MIZ program the year before, which was focused really on the melting process. 
so we're focused on the fall when the ice recovers and advances southward again after its minimum. And we're also focused on the, some of the wave-driven processes. And I'll motivate that with the next slide. So now we're on the third slide here. And this is a polar view looking down. You can see the land is all in gray and, and the bottom you see Alaska. And the color scale shows you an average over uh, 30 years, uh, an average of the, the trend, or really it's a rate, in the days per year that ice advance happens later. I'm pause here for a second because that's sort of a complicated metric until you get used to it. Um, but what it means is uh, that if you have a dark red color, that location sees ice two days later every single year. So let's make some easy math for a day later per year. If you go 30 years, that amounts to a month over that entire, uh, that entire time period. Um, so in the, the Beaufort and Chukchi Seas, just north of the Alaska coastline there, that is the really intense red cover. I'll use my cursor here if you can see that to highlight that area. Those are really where the trend is the strongest. And this means that region there is uh, seeing several days per year uh, later when the ice comes back in the fall. And over this whole period, that means that it's actually a month later that ice is returning to those areas after the seasonal ice minimum. Making this even more plain English, there used to be ice coming back in September. Now the ice comes back in October. It's a full month later. And the same thing is happening sort of in a similar or analogous way on the melt back and the retreat of the ice, and that's actually received a lot more attention. So I won't focus on it here. What we've really focused on is the, the other side of that is once you've lost all that ice in the summer, uh, how does it come back? Because we know it mostly does come back. By the time you get to the winter, we have a full ice cover more or less. Now, quality is another question on that ice. As we just heard about with ice X, the, the quality may be changing too. But really, it's, it's sort of when is this happening and, and where are the changes the biggest. And so Beaufort and Chukchi Seas have the biggest trend, um, and that's where we chose to focus. So uh, I'll overlay here a black square that says this is our focus region here. And uh, the, the next thing that's interesting about this to us, especially with our focus on surface periods, is that this fall period, now going into October, still having open water in this area, um, that's an area and a time in which there are strong storms that come through. There's a storm track that moves through here, and there's a lot of wind. If you have a lot of wind and you have open water, you can have waves. And so that's the other part of the story is that the ice is returning later and later every year, and that persisting open water is a place where you can drive a lot of wave activity if you have strong winds. And indeed, you can have strong winds in the fall in this region. The way we understand that is um, as a function of the fetch, that's the distance over which the wind acts. If you have more open water, you have more space, then given the same wind forcing, you'll end up with more waves because that's what you need to, to accumulate the energy from the wind. You need a lot of space and you need time also. So um, if I click again, the, there's an overlay that will appear on the right-hand side for those of you following along your own slide deck, and this is an analysis that we did prior to the start of this program where we looked at from some of the other moorings in the Beaufort that are um, part of the Beaufort Gyre program that's run or done by Woods Hole. We've added some wave measurements to those moorings, and we've been showing that the wave energy on the vertical axis throughout the Beaufort Basin scales as a function of the wave fetch. And we have this non-dimensional power law that describes this, and it works very well throughout the Beaufort. So when there's more fetch, there's more waves, given the same wind forcing. And, and so this says that we really should be expecting a, a big wave signal that accompanies this delay in the ice recovery. We have done a bunch of work in this program on climatology to try to address that, and that's where I'll go with slide number four now. These are three panels showing us uh, results from wave model hindcast predictions from 1990 to present day. The three panels are the significant wave height, that's a statistical measure of how big the, the waves are the, from a random wave field. Uh, then that's the, the next panel, the middle panel is the peak wave period, that's how frequently the waves pass by a, a point in time. 
And then the bottom panel is the wind speed, given as the 10 meter winds in meters per second. And what you see over this time period, over about 25 years, is that there's a significant trend in the wave height. So in this region, the waves are, are growing. The waves are getting larger on average. You also see a trend in the wave period. They're getting longer period. And that's associated with that fetch uh, process because as the wind blows over larger and larger bodies of water, not only do you accumulate more energy in the wind, but you make a more mature wave. And this is why the surf is so good in the Pacific, whereas it's kind of marginal in the Atlantic because the Pacific's a bigger ocean. So um, you, make, you make better waves from the surfer's perspective because you make them longer period. Uh, and those waves have a different set of physics. They carry more energy, they travel faster, and they may penetrate further into an ice pack. So there are lots of things that we're interested in about that trend. It's not just the wave height that's interesting. It's the, the period that also is a big part of the story. Perhaps most interesting, though, is uh, the bottom panel, which shows that the wind speed, at least from these model high caps, is not changing. So it's not that the Arctic and, and the Western Arctic, the Beaufort and Chukchi regions, are not getting windier in general, in particular. Now, this is a result that's averaged over that whole domain, so it's quite smooth. Um, but it's really not that there's uh, more wind. It's that there's more open water. And if you have the same wind and more open water, then you can drive more waves. And so this climatology result is something that um, it gives us the, the, the big picture. And of course, how any given year unfolds is going to be a complicated story with the preconditioning of the ice and the actual individual storms that come through. And that's where we're challenged to describe this with a climatology because um, it's really the events and some of the extreme events that really drive the system at times. And it may be, you know, one really spectacular storm in October may be an outlier uh, relative to this, but it, even amongst something that has a lot of stochastic process to it, uh, we're seeing these strong trends. And so this leads us to an overall question, just in plain English, that's the overlay I'll click on here, which is what are the effects of an increasing Arctic sea state, uh, a, a place where the wave activity is, is more significant and increasing? What is that doing in the autumn when freeze up is occurring. We know freeze up is happening later. We know it's important in setting the stage for what happens throughout the winter and even the following year when the ice retreats again. So uh, are, are the sort of hierarchy or ranking of processes changing with these extra waves and what are the waves doing there? Now, moving on to the next slide, this is a schematic of the observational campaign that we planned in order to do this. And this is what we just executed in the fall of 2015. So we've been back for a few months now. It's a program that's pretty heavily ship-based, and you see the, uh, the Sekuliak there is on the right-hand side of the image. Um, and there are a lot of measurements we made that were ship-based, but we also used a lot of autonomous platforms. So you see uh, AUVs and gliders and things in the ocean, some moorings that we put out, in addition to continuing the collaboration with the Beaufort Gyre program and, and piggybacking on their moorings. Lots of various surface buoys that we put out, some which ride in open water, some which ride on the ice. Uh, and then a very important and heavy remote sensing campaign, both satellite-based, uh, unmanned aerial systems, and then not included in the schematic, but I'll show later, uh, manned aerial systems, fixed-wing aircraft flying over. So putting this all together. And it's a lot of instrumentation and a lot going on and uh, of many different teams that come together to be able to study the air, the ice, the ocean, the waves all together. Um, but the thing that really was most challenging about this, and, and I think one of the great successes of the program, was doing this all in a very uh, adaptive way in terms of the, the planning. Now, adaptive cruise planning is something that gets tossed around a lot, so I want to uh, spend more time on that and talk about this uh, three-day rolling plan of the day uh, approach that we used where we had an operational area that we wanted to work in, and we, we settled on that early on, but we did not define a cruise track. And in a moment, I'll show you the cruise track, and it looks honestly a bit schizophrenic. It looks like we were driving all over the place. Uh, but there was a lot of science behind that, because what we did is entered the area, looked at the forecast, both in terms of the weather forecast, the ice forecast, and the wave forecast, many of which were being run on board the ship and then supported by a large shore team that was making additional forecasts, and we said, 
where are the processes we want to study going to really be most evident? And then we designed in real time uh, a program on a three-day planning window to go to that region, to go often to an ice edge or just inside of the forming pack and set up a suite of measurements that, that would capture that according to what had been forecast. To set up for this, we did a lot of planning exercises and we built up a sort of a playbook of different plans of the day. So when we saw something unfolding, we said, okay, now we're gonna have on ice wind and waves at a consolidated ice pack, so here's the plan. Here's how we lay out the buoys. We make two transects in laying out the buoys and then we continue to transect back and forth with every third transect being along ice and the other two being uh, across ice, something like that. Or now we're gonna have off ice winds and we're gonna look at the fetch evolution through partial ice cover and we're gonna have a different array design. So we put a lot of thought into this ahead of time and then we were able to, to sort of pick and choose and, and, and grab and go with these different scenarios that we had mapped out. Um, and many of which did play out somewhat close to, to how we envisioned them. Of course, things are always more complicated in the field than, than they are when you, when you map them out on a whiteboard. But um, it was quite effective and it was really uh, supported by the satellite remote sensing products that we were getting in near real time, able to display on board the Sekuliak and, and pick the positions that we wanted to be in and, and, and make the best use of the ship time. And in some cases, we weren't able to transit to the, the, the next best thing that was coming, so we'd make some sort of compromise. But we were able to get around quite well and, and use this um, adaptive approach to, to get the most science done. And also just to keep everyone on the same page as to what we were doing. On the shore team, we had the satellite remote sensing team, we had the forecasting team, um, and we had the, the aircraft team trying to fly out over us, and everyone needed to know, you know the who, what, where, when. And so every evening after uh, an all-hands meeting, we would send out the plan of the day that mapped out in very fine detail what was had to happen the next day, and then in coarser and coarser detail what was happening in the few days following that, and we kept refining that. So we'll move on now to, um, to look at how this actually, um, this actually really unfolded. And so now on the next slide is a small um, thumbnail image of our actual cruise track, and I'll show you a larger one in just a second, but I want to, to um, show the overall conditions here first. So in this cruise track, the track is shown in red. Um, north slope of Alaska is the, the green. Um, you can see the bathymetry underneath, and you can see Point Barrow in the center of the, uh, the coastline there. And so our nominal cruise track was to come out over the shallows, the, the Chukchi slope, which is the white bathymetry contours. Um, we did some work near the shelf break, eventually moved off and in up in sort of North Wind Ridge area, and then eventually made it out into the, the Beaufort Gyre, which is about 3,000 meters deep in the darker blue or the light blue. Uh, and we spent time over there and, and basically went around this oddly shaped cruise track in a somewhat clockwise manner. Now, of course, I, I led off saying that what we wanted to do was, was see what was happening during the freeze up. And so that's the first part is just to show you that as we went through that cruise track, what the ice was doing. When we started, I'll overlay this left-hand side image now. This is uh, the ice when we started. The colors are the concentration from the Answer 2 satellite product, and purple is 100% ice cover, and the sort of um, greenish colors are about 50%, and then blue is um, uh, just 10 or so percent ice cover. And so you can see when we began, most of this region was ice-free. This is on October 1st, 2015. There was a remnant tongue of ice that had been sticking around for most of the summer there that provided an interesting um, bit to study. There were some multi-year bits and brash all through here, but, all, but a, a real mix of, of kind of remnant ice in there. By the time we were beginning to wrap up our cruise a month later, it looked like this on the right-hand side. 100% ice cover basically over the entire Beaufort and much of the Chukchi, uh, at least to the shelf break. And the only thing that remained ice free, and, and not for very much longer after this really, um, is the shallow section of the Chukchi, which has a heavy influence from the Pacific water that comes through the Bering Strait. So most of it is all ice covered. So in terms of timing, the climatology really paid off for us. October was the time to be there. We saw the ice go from its minimum, advance through the entire area we were interested in, and get to full ice cover and attach to the land fast ice down on the Alaska coastline. 
But I don't want you to come away from these two images with the naive view that the ice simply progressed south from the left image to get to the right image. Uh, the actual story is a much more complicated one where the ice would advance a bit and then stall or even retreat again and then advance again. And the sea state and the storms uh, that came through and also the, the ocean uh, really were driving that story and making the progression from the left image to the right image a much more complicated thing. So I'll walk you through a little bit of that by showing you first uh, the cruise track a little larger now. So now I'm on a slide that shows the whole cruise, cruise track and shows the, an image of the Sequoiac in the upper right. This is from one of our ice stations taken standing out on an ice hole looking back at the Sequoiac. So now if I go to our cruise track here, I'm going to trace with my cursor how we came up from Nome, worked at the ice edge here, came over here, and we did a series of different activities, many of which are annotated on here. Um, and the two most common things we did were ice stations, where we would sample uh, uh, and survey uh, pieces of ice, a flow of ice, uh, and then wave arrays. And wave arrays are where we put out many wave buoys that measure waves, and some of the buoys also measure winds and fluxes and surface temperature and salinity and surface turbulence. And we would put out uh, arrays of these buoys to map spatial gradients and then watch things in, in evolve in time. And that space-time combination turned out to be a, a big part of, of how we did those activities. So you can see these different annotations as we move through and move around in this clockwise manner and then eventually link back and cross our own track here and come through and back down around. The next slide I'll show you is an animation of this cruise track, and it's a very busy slide, so I want to just get you ready for it before I show it to you. The cruise track will be uh, on there in white, and as we go through it, it'll be get filled in in purple. There'll be color scales in the background that show you the forecast wave heights, and so the red colors will be big waves, and the blue colors will be small waves, and then there'll also be a few uh, contours shown for ice concentration, and you can see how things unfolded. Uh, you can see this, our cruise in a two-minute movie. So moving to that slide now, plays automatically. You can see the purple is filling in as we go through. So we enter the pack ice here. It's all dark blue here because there are no waves deep in the pack ice. That's as far north as we got. And then when we came out to the edge of the Beaufort, you can see this big wave event come through here, large four- and five-meter waves incident to the evolving ice pack. And that was one of the more interesting events that we observed and the waves died down for a little bit. We went back into the ice pack, came to this other sector because we were looking for waves coming from the west. We, and then we eventually came back out to this ice edge here and watched some both on and off ice forcing of wind and waves. And we ended up spending a lot of time tracing a pattern, a survey pattern that we call the racetrack, back and forth along this ice edge as it advanced, retreated, advanced, retreated, depending on what was happening. And then eventually we headed back out. So now it's replaying. I'll let it go for a little while longer just to show you on this replay what happened when we got off to the southeast corner here. This is an ice edge that was progressing, advancing very quickly, and then this big storm came through and really changed the game, it really caused a lot of this ice to go away. And our early analysis is that that ice that was forming rapidly began to melt in place as that storm went through. And that's because the storm drove a tremendous amount of mixing. And there's a lot of heat that's in the upper ocean that uh, can be released when you have an event like that. And that heat may only be 20 meters down in the near surface temperature maximum. And that is quite a reservoir of heat that can really uh, can fight against the surface fluxes that the atmosphere is imposing and, and stop the freezing process altogether. Okay, now I'll move on to the next slide, uh, which is just a big, long, proud list of all the things we did. And I won't go through too many details, but I want to give you a, a feel for what these different stations amounted to in some of these measurements. So the first in the list is 12 ice stations that we did. Uh, and much of that work was in mapping the ice. We used AUVs to map underneath the ice to get topography underneath the ice, from which you can infer much about the morphology and evolution of the ice. We also put out several autonomous buoys, ice mass balance buoys that, that look at the thermodynamics. We, there was a lot of unmanned aerial systems or, or drones that were used to map from above. And you can see the image here that I'm showing of the ship is using one of those, those, some of the drone footage to see that. 
And then there are um, LIDAR scans, and that's a, a laser scanning system for topography, scanning above the ice so we can map above and below and look at the character of the ice and understand uh, what this ice is made of both before, during, and after some wave events. So we would often do an ice station, then uh, have a, a wave event and put out the wave buoys and do those wave measurements and then repeat an ice station to see what had happened sort of, you know, before or after. The wave uh, measurements themselves use a variety of buoys. I'm showing a few of them here. These are swift buoys on the rail of the ship there and then um, pancake wave buoys on the deck. Uh, we did over 70 total deployments of these buoys um, and they were often deployed in uh, carefully designed arrays so that their spacing is such that you can see the attenuation of the waves and you can see changes in the wavelengths of the waves and that the directionality of the waves as they come into the ice and they get damped by the ice and they get scattered by the ice. And those are some key physics that we're looking at that are now getting included in the wave process models, the wave forecast models that will be used in future work in the Arctic. We also use a stereo system based on the ship uh, to look at some of this wave motion. Then we had a lot of underway data, including this racetrack that I mentioned where we were uh, going in and out of the ice uh, near the shelf break towards the end of the experiment. And here is where you see a lot of the things that were ship-based are listed here. One of the most important was the visual ice observations, and this is literally a trained observer standing on the bridge um, using WMO codes to note what type of ice is being observed, dominant ice type, secondary ice type, ice sizes, variability in the ice. And uh, this is where I'll start to come back to this theme of pancake ice. These visual ice observations, uh, really the, the most remarkable thing from them is that most of the time we were in some pancake ice. We saw pancake ice uh, really just uh, daily, if, uh, if not hourly. Uh, we have camera images to confirm this and, and to start being more quantitative about this as the actual size of the pancake, the distribution, you know, flow size distributions, ice cover, those things. And those images are starting to be processed now. We did a lot of physical sampling underway um, using dip nets uh, and uh, frazzle ice tubes to sample the ice. Uh, we had an over-the-side system that had a, uh, an EMI and uh, altimeters that we called the stims, and that was always over the side as the ship was transiting. We had a, a radar that we used to get wave and ice data. Uh, more LIDAR measurements now done from the ship. And then in switching colors here, those, are, those were all ice measurements. The dark blue is an ocean measurement. There's a conductivity, temperature, and depth cast. Uh, and this was something we, we really were able to do a tremendous amount of because we're using an underway system. So traditionally, you'd make a CTD cast when you stop and take a station. And it would take, depending on how deep you're casting, anywhere from 30 minutes to three hours. Um, in contrast, we almost never stopped for a CTD because we're using this underway system. Uh, we did it continuously, and we ended up with over 4,000 CTD casts. So we basically have a good map of the upper ocean and the heat content of the upper ocean throughout our entire domain and our entire cruise, which is really a, a wonderful data set to, to have to understand how the ocean is participating in these surface fluxes. And we have a lot of atmospheric measurements, weather balloons, and then a complete flux package um, doing all of the direct fluxes of heat and momentum and moisture uh, from the bow of the ship. So that's a list of all these data that were collected. And now, with the time remaining, I want to take you through just a couple examples of how this all came together on any given um, uh, day, where we had a plan of the day and we tried to use all these tools at our disposal. Um, and uh, I'll take you through one that now I'm on the next slide, which is a timeline. And I'll take you through one that was very early on in this timeline where we had some on-ice winds. Um, and you can see in this timeline that going through October and into November, um, we had a, a real nice variety. So I'm only going to show you two cases, but we really captured many times where the forcing, the wind and the waves were coming from the open water onto the ice, and those are the red events. And we also had times when the, the wind was coming from the pack ice and blowing out onto the open water, and so we really can compare and contrast those things. Uh, we also had lots of different um, you know, times when we were at the ice edge or within the pack going back and forth, and we tried to really um, fully populate all those different cases. So looking at one of the on-ice uh, wind cases here, um, I'll show you some of the remote sensing that, that came into this. The remote sensing, I said earlier when I was talking, when I was talking about the plan of the day, was a, a big part of how we did this, and these uh, Red images now on 
are showing you the, the frames, the corner points of all the satellite remote images that were taken. And there were over um, 800 of these taken of a variety of different uh, shapes and sizes. We had great support from the National Ice Center, um, direct support from uh, Terrasar X and the German Space Agency, additional radar set from our Canadian colleagues, um, and uh, really just a, a remarkable amount of data collected. And then the new Sentinel-1 product from uh, the Europeans came online just in time for this, and we were able to get some of those as well. Uh, so I'll show in a second for the case study, uh, I'll look at w one of these examples. The other thing we had, we also had uh, fixed wing aircraft that were manned aircraft in addition to those drones that were flying over this. But here's the track in black now, um, this overlay that was flown by the NRL Twin Otter uh, that came up to work with our operations. And they did five flights and they flew a SAR that's very similar to the SAR that's on uh, the, the satellites. And the difference is they have much higher resolution doing it from a plane. So we can start to make some comparisons. And I've already highlighted the pancake ice. And one of the things that is challenging about the pancake ice is the pancakes are often about 50 centimeters in diameter, which is too small for any of the satellites to see. So what does pancake ice look like in a SAR image? Well, um, we still don't quite have that answer, but you know, adding in this NRL flight data that has very high resolution SAR is going to help us do that, help us merge what we did in situ to what we want to be able to see from the satellites. They also flew a LIDAR and flew a visual camera that's all been registered to real-world coordinates. Um, and then finally, we had an, an opportunistic overflight from a NASA program called uh, UAV SAR, and they did one flight that's overlaid, shown in green now over that, and that was coordinated by one of our team members, Ben Holt. So this all this remote sensing. So here's one example of using it. This example is at the ice edge, and now I'm on the, the slide that says example ice edge, and in the left-hand side, we're looking at a Radar Sat 2 image and a green icon showing where the ship is. This is as we saw it on the ship. We received this Radar Sat 2 image direct to the ship. We were able to display it using the map server on board the ship, which is a system um, that's been built and maintained by Steve Roberts, and it's a huge asset to have on board the Sekuliak. You can see really you know, what, you, what you're doing in almost real time. The situational awareness is, is really key to doing this. And so you see this ice edge that is uh, complicated and has uh, the bright white pixels of the ice edge. And we picked a section that is about 10 kilometers long that looks like a pretty solid section of ice here. And we brought the ship in next to that and said, we're going to do a study going in and out of this ice edge, putting some buoys offshore uh, in open water, in through the ice and then beyond into the, the mix of, of partial ice cover that's beyond in this marginal ice zone. But when we got on station and started to do this work, we realized that things were much more complicated than this one snapshot from the SAR would suggest. And that's where another version of the remote sensing became really critical, and that is the shipboard radar, which allows us to see waves and ice. So now my overlay going on the bottom right here, um, which captures the black box that also overlays, is one image from the ship's radar. So the center of this image is always the ship itself. The bright pixels on the right-hand side that have a, an oblique edge to them, that is the ice as seen by the radar. The scale is four kilometers on a side, and it lets you see where you are relative to the ice. This looks like a nice straight ice edge, and this is what we saw when we first got on station and we began a 12-hour operation measuring uh, the fluxes in and out of this region, going from open water in through this band of ice and then to some of the um, loose pack ice beyond it, which has quite a bit of open water on the back side of this. I'm going to play a movie that shows uh, the radar images all combined in a time-lapse movie of us moving around, and so the center will always be where the ship is, and there will always be an occluded spot behind the ship that doesn't have a radar return because the mast of the ship is in the way. So it'll look like a little thin uh, pie-shaped wedge that's missing. So if I uh, space ahead here, we'll see this movie start to play. So there's the ship. The red is a buoy we just deployed, and we go into the ice, put a buoy inside the ice in a band of open water. Then we turn and we come out, we put a buoy right in the ice band. We come all the way out and go way out into open water to recover a buoy that we had deployed 
the day before, and then we transect back in and start rounding up some of those buoys. All the while, the ice edge has been deforming and changing and moving and advecting. New ice is forming, old ice is getting pushed in, and this is all happening over 12 hours. So what you saw with that one SAR image gave you one impression of what's happening, uh, but was really, what was really unfolding was much more complicated in space and time. So if you want to attribute changes in that, that ice pack to the fluxes you're measuring, you really need to know exactly where you are relative to everything. And the ship's radar has been key for doing that. So I'll play that one more time now um, just to let you see the, the dramatic evolution that happens at ice edge as we go through and how we're able to place buoys in different places. And remember, anywhere the ship is, where we're also getting this flux data of what are the heat fluxes, what are the momentum fluxes. So I know we uh, probably many of you have a, appointments at the end of the hour. I'm going to make sure that I wrap this up in time and can take a few questions. So I'll close out that video and show you one more video, which is a different case that we did, which was the case with those, where I showed you the big red contours in the animation of our cruise track with this big storm that came through in the southeastern part of our domain. And that, that made big waves because there was fetch there. There was a lot of open water there in the Beaufort. And when the wind came through, it made nice big four or five meter tall waves. And the wave period was quite long. It was 10 or 11 seconds. That's a wave period that really would not have existed in the previous uh, Beaufort Sea. Now, we wouldn't have been able to observe that in the 90s because there wasn't enough fetch to make that. So what results from that are these pancakes here, which is shown in the still image. And now I'll click ahead and show you a video of what those pancakes look like with the waves rolling through. So this video is taken uh, standing on the aft deck of the ship, watching these waves roll through. This is as the, the waves are started to die off a little bit. So these waves are only about two or three meters. They got up to four meters. Um, and you can see a real mix of different things going on here. The pancakes are a variety of safe shapes and sizes and packing density. And there's also a stretch of open water here where you can see some of the, the windrows um, and the, uh, the effect of the wind on the water. There, it's quite windy. You can hear that in the microphone, too. Uh, and there's some evidence that there were Langmuir circulations during this time, and that may have been a big part of the mixing. And we have um, one of the PhD students on board the ship is going to be working on that. So. This is, this is the kind of condition where you get pancake ice, and this is, uh, at least for our work in October 2015, I would say this is the dominant ice formation mechanism in the Beaufort and Chuck Chi Seas now. And that's something that uh, we might have guessed but wouldn't have said and wouldn't have had much evidence for prior to this work. You know, there, there really have not been a lot of cruises through this region in October and especially into November, and there haven't been the waves to drive this in the past. So I think this is part of what what's going to be in the new Arctic. So I'll move on from that video now and start to wrap up so we have time for questions. So here is the science team that was on board the ship. Um, but I should be careful to give credit to everyone on shore because we really had this incredible team doing the shore support, doing the remote sensing, doing the forecasting, and working with us every single day to make sure that we were getting the, the best use of the ship and the instruments we had on hand. A lot of this, a lot more information at this website here that I'm showing at the bottom here that's at the AP, it's hosted by APL and it's simply Arctic Sea State. And while I'm sharing my screen here, I'll just take you out of the presentation and show you some of the things that are on there. So as we come up with publications, they're being added on here. Both our science plan are here uh, and the cruise report from immediately after uh, the cruise, which is basically just a narrative of what we did, that's on here. Um, there are uh, some blogging we did during the cruise is on here. And another thing, if you uh, want to use any of this as sort of outreach material, there's a video that was compiled on here uh, that has some interviews with some of us, but more importantly, um, has a bunch of footage from us in the field, including footage from the drones while the drones are flying above us and, and looking at what we've been doing. So it's, uh, it's a really nice place to get a feel for you know, what it's like to work up there if you're doing any activities with a classroom or somewhere where you want to show students you know, uh, what it's like working up there, then you can see some of the deck work and some of the things we did. So I encourage you to go to the website as a resource um, and uh, get in touch with me also if there's other things you'd like to see up here or material that you, uh, you think maybe exists and you'd like access to and we're happy to provide it. Okay, now I'll take questions.
So while everyone unmutes themselves to um, ask questions, um, whoever wants to go first, please do. No questions for Jim? Hey, Martin, this is Jessica. Um, I have an email question from uh, Rachel Aubert, and she's asking, are your buoys anchored or free-floating? They are freely drifting. That's a good question. We did have two moorings out, um, and those time series are, are helpful uh, context, you know, because uh, sometimes when you're drifting, it's hard to tell what's changing space or time when you're doing the analysis. But now, freely drifting um, is certainly much simpler operationally, but also really can uh, dramatically improve the data quality, not having something moored as, as the ice comes through. Right? We, get, um, we avoid any distortion from uh, Doppler shifting, um, and we get to you know, have the buoy stay with the ice that's affecting them and, and, not, get, and not tear moorings out and around. I mean, if you, uh, if you moor something and you try to have a fight with the ice, you will lose. And the mooring will lose, the ice will win. We, we know that. Thank you, Jim. I couldn't find my unmute button before. <laughs> okay, is there anybody else who has found their unmute button and wants to ask a question? Well, it doesn't seem as though anybody else has any questions, uh, not at the moment. If you do have a question, if something comes to you in the middle of the night tonight or whenever, um, you can submit your question by email directly to Jim, or you could do it via the IOPIC Collaborations website. And I'm sure Jim will do everything he can uh, to answer by return email. Um, so, since there appears to be no further questions, I'd like to thank Jim very much for his presentation telling us about um, the Arctic Sea State uh, field experiment, and um, we can look forward, I'm sure, to the special issue of JGR, I believe, um, which will be devoted to the uh, results of the research, not only the field experiment, but other research that's going on, that has been going on before the field experiment and uh, will be going on uh, now in conjunction with the analysis of the results, synthesis of the results of the field experiment. So again, thanks very much, Jim. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this and share it with the, the IARPIC CI team. And since it is now one minute past two, I'll just mention again that here's an opportunity if anyone has any news, any exciting new results or anything they'd like to mention about milestones and reporting, um, please please do so now. Um, I'm always going to mention milestones uh, whenever 